Good morning. Today, Olaf and I will be talking about how to build a virtual machine in the three separate cloud providers, AWS, Azure, and GCP. Please like and subscribe if you like this content. That way, we know to make more of it. First, we will be start getting started with AWS. What I find interesting is that even though you can learn Terraform as a separate language, you still have to learn each of the resources and parameters. In this example, you can use a data resource to get the ID number of the Amazon machine image or AMI you want to use. This is required as part of the definition of the resource. This is all that's the mandatory requirements of creating just an AWS instance. So if I just show you, now if I do a Terraform apply, you'll see that the instance is being created. Now, there are tons of different parameters and attributes and blocks that you could use for the AWS instance. Um, one thing I noticed that was different than the other two providers we'll be covering is there's a parameter called get underscore password underscore data, which will get the login login information for a Windows machine that is generated as a, the virtual is created. Or in Linux, you can set an AWS key pair. So just because you're like, I want to build a virtual machine in one cloud platform, it's going to be different as you'll see in the different uh, environments. So now yeah, that and, you see- And right away, I, I recognize some of the differences from what you might see in other providers. And notably, what I don't see here is any networking parameters. So um, when you create this instance, are you um, are you attaching it to a pre-existing network by default? Um, I think it's just it's uh, in this case it's just grabbing um, whatever the the default options are. I can tell you it does get a public DNS and does get a public IP, so it it. You know, it is part of like as the defaults are set up, it'll generate that stuff on its own. While other cloud uh, providers, it's more of a mandatory setup as part of the creation. So this one has a public IP, so you can access it doing other things. Um, you can connect, get into it via SSH once you you can set things up manually. But this is just like. Well, I just want a VM. Look, I've I've got one. Uh, so that like this one was actually the easiest one of the two, which is not generally my experience with AWS. It's usually <laughs> um, much more complex. Well, I guess what I would what I would say is that it's perhaps easy if you're okay with defaults because it has perhaps the fewest options that um, uh, that are required. Mm -hmm. But I would say that. Most people are going to deploy something with a lot more parameters defined. Right. Um, if we look up, as you'll see, the image here, the machine is being created. But if you look, look it up real quick. So, yeah, there are a lot of different options you can configure. And even in the the networking perspective. Yeah. But um, definitely go through the different parameters. Um, and even like you can't even match up the different parameters as much between the different cloud providers either, because each one's like, oh, well, this is this is important to us. CPU, a CPU core count is important here, you know, theoretically. But it may not be important to the other cloud provider. Next step, we can take a look at how Azure does it. Starting at version 3, the Azure RM provider 
split out the Windows and the Linux virtual machines with se as separate resources. So before this was before it was similar to the other two cloud providers where they have one resource for Linux and Windows, but in what in the Azure they split them out. Yeah, and I think there are still some people that I, I don't know that it was completely deprecated, but I, I believe that there are still people that use the um, Azure AM virtual machine resource instead of the Windows or Linux. Um, but certainly the Windows and Linux specific virtual machine resources are the, the preferred way to go. And um, for that matter, I believe that there are some features at this point that are locked out of the uh, Azure AM virtual machine resource. Uh, and mm -hmm. the only way you can get to them is by using the specific Linux or Windows resource. I would agree. Uh, they, yes, um, yeah, yeah, I agree. I don't know how much more to say about that. So, you know, this is Azure, so it's a little different. You have to have a resource group. You didn't need that per AWS. You could just spin up a, a virtual machine without anything like that. This one requires you to define a virtual network. Um, so, you know, like before you kind of use the, div, I use the default one. You could use the, this defines it, you know, create your subnet that kind of goes with it because it's all associated with the Azure RM network interface. And that, that's one of those differences that I spoke to. So in AWS, there is a default VPC Whereas in mm -hmm. Azure, um, there is not. Yeah, exactly. Um, so in here, this is the uh, Linux virtual machine. One big thing I notice is, you know, you kind of define the admin username and password here versus like the other ones you would like in AWS use like AWS key store or it generated for you and then you can change it afterwards theoretically. So you can set the SSH key and kind of import it from your local machine using the file function. Um, you can set, you know, you set your different operating system disks. And then here, instead of providing like an ID, uh, you actually set the version of the operating system. So, you know, AMI is more designed for like, you can create your own AMI, you can use a default AMI, there's you know, the worlds your ocean there. It's probably similar because you can create your own published um, image, but you know, you can just use the default without, you know, pulling down like this is the SKU you can use and what version is the latest one. But this is yeah, and I, I know one of the advantages of the Azure marketplace in regards to these images is the frequency at which they're updated. So of course, with a Windows machine, um, you can guarantee that the uh, those machines have been updated uh, very frequently. I think they I, I don't know what the SLA on that is, but I, I believe that they are um, maintained at least to patch Tuesday. So monthly mm -hmm. updates applied automatically to the marketplace images. So if you're pulling those in, then you're you're kind of getting that value add by having them already patched and ready. Linux machines are going to be based upon the vendors, um, and that may be the same with with the AWS marketplace. It may be up to the vendors to implement their own uh, patching program for the AMIs or for the the VM images in the marketplace. Um, but yeah, that I I believe I believe Ubuntu maintains them within few months maybe it's less than that now i haven't looked recently okay yeah that makes sense you know you have to you know a downside of using the vm you'll end up patching it right away and then creating your own maintenance plan but yeah it's just nice that they're at least caught up versus if you just built your own you have to kind of like update it make sure it's updated and make sure your image is updated things like that yeah um one thing you know between the two is you know the admin username and you know when i was looking at the windows one which was very similar you you can set the username and password in the terraform uh that's that's great except for now it's in the state file so that could be you know depending on your security 
requirements that can be a challenge. Yeah, always protect your state file because everything winds up going in there. Um, even private keys and things that if you're passing, if you're creating those with Terraform and passing them in, then those things are going to be in state as well. So I'm going to do a Terraform plan real quick. Make this a little bit bigger for people to read. I did notice so, this took longer to do than the AWS one when I was. Yeah, also yeah. The, the Azure API is probably the slowest of the three clouds. I've heard some reasons for that. I don't. I don't know if I buy it, but um, it is kind of interesting. I'm. I feel that there is something fundamentally different about the Azure APIs that causes them to be a slower process to work with. Um, and I would have to guess that the reason they aren't faster is because it is fundamental and they can't just fix it, right? They have to rewrite the, um, the functions or re-implement in a way that would just behave a lot faster. Like at the core of it? Yeah, exactly. Like it's, it's going to be a um, API 4.0 or whatever. Then everybody has. We see to incremental this. updates frequently, but I haven't seen significant speed increases, except in the case of resources. Individual resources will speed up, but the mm -hmm. the whole API does not seem to speed up. Um, one of the things that I had heard for the reasons is because of the way that they do distributed replication. So the idea being that um, there are, for instance, the global global resources, things that have unique names across the entirety of Azure, or at least across regions. Um, in order for that to work, there has to be a, um, often to, I, I don't actually know if it's synchronous or asynchronous, but I can imagine it being a synchronous activity to synchronize, for instance, a storage account name, um, where it is very specifically um, important that that name be unique across the entirety of the uh, of Azure. Yeah, we answered a question about that in uh, Discord just the other day. Yeah. So as you can see, it's applying. And as this is going, and again, like there are more options for each one of these different resources. But I just thought it was interesting. It's like I, you're thinking. Well, I want to create this one resource. I'm going to go look at a different cloud. I'm going to do the same thing, you know, multi-cloud. But then you realize you have to go you're going to learn their version of the same resource. It's not like a simple one-to-one. -one. Yeah. So what you're what you're getting as a value is um, the syntax. Obviously, Terraform syntax remains the same across all providers. Um, and then the ultimately the life cycle, the, the way in which you operate with Terraform can remain the same. So whether it's a CICD pipeline or manual executions, all of that can remain the same across providers. And as you can see, the virtual machine has been created and it is running in West Europe because that's what defined. And that con concludes the Azure part of this discussion. Next up, we'll be talking about GCP. So this is the GCP version of creating a virtual machine. Again, it's different. Um, you know, they have slightly different concepts on how to build things out, things out. You know, this is less to me less complex than the Azure RM version, more complex than the default AWS one. This also does the same kind of thing where. You know, I'm defining a network here um, called default. That's like just like probably what the AWS one was doing in the background. Let's increase the size on that. It's a bit small. Okay. Perfect. So this is the GCP resource. Uh, again, like for the default, instead of like in the Azure RM one, we defined. You know, we actually you had to define the initial VNet. Like uh, Google Cloud also has like a default one. So does uh, AWS does the same thing. Um, it's probably what it used previously. But I'm, I'm also uh, guessing that it, the case, the the best practice with all of these is that you never use the defaults. 
that you, um, uh, in, in re regards to a network, you always create your own network, um, unless it's some sort of test. But I'm guessing that any sort of enterprise uh, network needs to apply to enterprise standards, especially if you have on-prem connectivity. And so you're, you're not gonna use the default at that point. No, I agree. Uh, the challenge I ran into when I was pulling the documentation out was, you know, this scratch disk, you know, it needed it, it wants it to be not SCSI because it's matched to the virtual machine type. I realized it's optional, so I commented it out. But I mean, this one, like I think Google Cloud is a more tag based. So, I mean, they all are, but this is a little bit more pre prevalent in the documentation. Yeah, I think the tags in GCP and AWS are different uh, because in Azure, it is really just metadata. Um, but in the others, it's metadata, but it's also a way to filter or search for resources, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, in Azure, when you want to find a resource, you are generally uh, putting the context to a resource group. That's kind of your, your filter. Uh, and then you find by name or by count of resource type, whatever. The other thing I noticed different was, you know, do you actually define the boot disk? So before we were defining like the um, AMI for the AWS one, you need the ID number, um, or Windows or the Azure version, you needed to like, you created like, this is the version of Ubuntu, you know, 16, whatever, using the latest. And this one is similar. And this is just going to a path of where the image is. And since this is a default uh, image for Google Cloud, you know, it's just Debian Cloud, but it doesn't, you know, there's not as much information required for it. And I, I assume that maybe that's the default of the example. I assume that there's no problem in actually using an Ubuntu image inside of AWS or inside of GCP. Nope. Nope. Just that one. It's just a default one. Um, you know, it was just saying, which, where is the path to that image? So, you know, you can do a little, you know, I, as I was doing my research, I was pulling out the different CLI commands to find out what like the defaults would be or, you know, what other options I had. Another thing is for, that was different was you would create like a service account to connect into the VM. Uh, that that was more of more prevalent in Google Cloud than it was in you know you you would use like an IAM role or uh, SSH key pairs and stuff versus in Google Cloud there it's more of a you know I need a Surface account to do that kind of thing but you know it's still not super complex there's lots of options on is all the, the service account the I, does that serve as the identity of the vm so as it communicates to other services it will be using that service account um i think it's more of let's look it up it's more of like creating your roles it's not super helpful. Allows management. I feel like this is more like creating the role to access that versus what you're talking about. Like um, in Azure, there's the identities, the system identities and things. Um, Okay, so this is actually more of like the managed identity. You're creating a service account and using it to reference the different objects. Okay, objects great. And stuff. Yeah, but, the managed identity resonates, um, and I, I think it's one that is really valuable. So um, managed ID, identity meaning, and perhaps even Google service account meaning that they are managed by someone else, so you don't have to keep up with password expiry. It, it takes care of that all by itself. So even though I only defined a, a few things in here, of course, there's lots of defaults and you would want to go through each one of them. <laughs>
make sure it's what you want and how it's defined. So you'll see my that my VM has been created. Um, and you can go through this little connect button and I'll take you to like the virtual machine. But you know, showing you guys these different cloud, the different options is just trying to show that, you know, here's something is, you know, pretty pivotal to the cloud, pretty trivial in general, like, you know, spinning up, but you know, this is different. You kind of have to go through each of the different clouds and you're like, okay, well, I want to create a VM. Oh, here are all the different parameters in Azure versus AWS versus Google Cloud. And some of them match up and some of them don't. It may be interesting to, to see actually a comparison of what the requirements are within Terraform and therefore within the clouds uh, to define each of these virtual machines. Uh, you know, I one thing we I didn't really talk about, and I'm not going to demo, you know, at least the languages are all the same, you know, um, uh, like Google Compute instance that made sense to me, you know, versus like the AWS, you know, AWS instance that makes sense. When I was like looking at Oracle and I was trying to help somebody and they used ter different language the words they were using did not necessarily match up to what I was looking for. So they're like, oh, I'm trying to do this, create a virtual machine. And I'm like looking and I'm like, why isn't there anything called instance or virtual machine or, you know? So, you know, it's like learning each provider that you have to like, it's like learning how to learn their, to their it and verbiage. What they call it. Yeah. So their vocabulary. Um, so that's all I've got for that. If you guys have any questions, please leave a comment and we will follow up. And thank you so much. All right. Thanks.